So welcome to the Futon Interviews. Today I'm interviewing my friend, a friend of the podcast, and he was a Hollywood screenwriter, um, done a lot of amazing things, met some amazing people. He's just an amazing person in general. Um, but we're going to talk to him about his story here. And uh, anyways, I'd, I'd like to introduce you to uh, uh, Dan here. And there's Dan. And uh, so Dan, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you hang out at the Kava bar and all that kind of stuff. And um, everybody really enjoys you there. Like what, uh, what's your philosophy on life? Well, because, because like, you know, I, there's a lot of people there and like, you just like kind of have this jolly, like, you know, like some days you're like jolly and most of the time you're jolly, you know, and, uh, it's just like, you're a great person, you know, I guess, uh, my philosophy of life, if I had to pick one, cause I feel like it changes day to day and if I've been working all day, the philosophy is like, I want to go home and I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. And then if I'm hanging out, it's like, life is good. Things yeah. are good. And then sometimes you'll be listening to someone talk and you're like, why would God create a situation <laughs> where I just have to listen to this? Yeah. Uh, I guess my overall philosophy Mm. I think the most mature thing that you can do as an adult is embrace your immaturity. Yeah, that's true. And not take everything quite as seriously. Yeah. Certain things obviously you need to take seriously, but sometimes all you can do is look at a situation that is so ridiculous that it couldn't possibly exist in a reasonable world and just laugh at it yeah because yeah. it's absolutely absurd yeah. um but i remember i i took mushrooms uh and I was having like all sorts of epiphanies yeah. and realizations and I like ran up to my friend Hunter and I just had this huge grin on my face and he was like, what? And I was like, dude, nothing matters. <laughs> He's like, what? Like, nothing matters, man. <laughs> and I was super stoked about that. Yeah. I understand how that's like really scary yeah. to some people, the fact that nothing matters. But to me, it meant like there isn't like this cosmic destiny. Right. Or like this perfect version of us that right. we need to live up to. Right. It's just kind of like, oh, we're here. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let's play in the sandbox. Yeah. Let's let's see what kind of trouble we can get into. I, I think I had a similar experience on mushrooms because, you know, I took mushrooms a couple months ago. And, uh, like, it was, it was amazing. Like, okay, first of all, like, I have this big, like, uh, religiosity complex, you know? Mm -hmm. And I felt like God or whatever, the universe was speaking to me. And it was like, it was so fucking weird, man. I was out of my mind. And it was like, it was like, it was kind of the same thing. Basically, what the mushrooms told me was that, everything's going to be all right, you know? Yeah. And it was like, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't like nothing matters, but it was like, it, it, it was just like, basically everything is going to be all right, you know? Well, yeah. And like, nothing matters to like an omniscient, like the things in your life matter. The people in your life matter yeah. because they matter to you. And right. like you create the meaning in your own life. That's yeah. not something that is created for you. Mm -hmm. Like as you exist in the world, you kind of determine the things that you value or the people that you value or what you want to. And 
you can only really succeed or fail based on your own metric of what that means. Yeah. And sometimes that needs to adjust. Like, if people are being, I don't know, too perfectionistic yeah, themselves, yeah. then it's like, adjust the expectation to something that you can accomplish more and then you're living up to that. Yeah. And you're doing it every day and yeah. that's a good way to live. You know, and that, that's kind of like, you know, you, what you just said like means a lot to me because uh, what I'm trying to do with this whole uh, podcast and everything is like, it, it's exactly how you said it. Like, basically you got to find the things that align with your values, you know? Yeah. And... I think that's amazing. That's amazing insight you got there, you know? And you'll figure it out. Yeah. Just by, like, doing it. Yeah. And, yeah, just, like, practicing and yeah. having people come on. You figure out, like, what ultimately you want out of it. Yeah. And so, uh, tell me about screenwriting. How did you get into screenwriting? Like, did you know as a kid you were always going to be a screenwriter? Or, like, how did you go about doing that? Well, I didn't know specifically I was going to be a screenwriter. I I knew that I was going to do something in in movies because mm. I just um, like my mom uh, tells me a lot of the time that when I was a kid, like we would watch a movie as a family, and then I would like disappear into my room, yeah, for like hours on end and like when I would come back out I would have and like I was like four or five when I was doing this but I would have like taken apart household appliances yeah and like refashioned them into costumes and oh, start like cool. acting out what I had just yeah. seen and like she said I would get the voices right and yeah. like I just wanted to like mimic what I had just seen as much yeah. as I could because movies had that kind of impact on me where I was just like I want to live and breathe this yeah like yeah. movies are just to me something that it transports you yeah, yeah. to another place in time and like has the power to be able to like tell stories and teach lessons yeah. and like to me movies have always been that thing that like I I love just sitting down and watching a good movie. Yeah. I love it. I even love sitting down and watching a bad movie. Yeah. And yeah. nowadays I watch more bad movies than I watch good yeah. movies, but all that means is that when you like see a really good movie you really appreciate it. Yeah. Because yeah. you're like that was really good. Um, I thought I was going to be an actor. Really? That's what I thought I was going to do. Um, I love acting. I did it all the time when I was a kid. And, um, you know, I played a sea monster in second grade. And, mm -hmm. like, I had one line. And I don't, I must have seen a commercial or something. Yeah. The night before, for whatever reason, I just, uh, I hammed it up. And I was <laughs> yeah. just like, it's dinner time! Yeah. Yeah. And all the adults started laughing. And I was like, I like making adults laugh. Yeah. I like making people laugh. Yeah. I love performing. So, um, I really threw myself into that. Yeah. And, um, you know, for... For most of my childhood, I was focused mainly on acting. And uh, when I was in high school, I went to like a film acting program. Mm -hmm. And I started, uh, like I loved acting, but I didn't particularly like hanging out with actors. Oh, like, yeah, I, I yeah. liked hanging out more with the film kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they'd be like, have you seen this? And I'd be yeah. like, yeah, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And we would, like, watch movies together. And yeah. they were just so much more chill. Like, it can be high drama when it's, like, actors yeah, yeah. kind of in a room together. And it's, it's always funny to me, like, 
when when I, when I meet people who uh, say they were a drama kid or something like that, because like, because like I'll meet them at the store or something, or even be a drama yeah. kids there, you know, at their workplace. And you they're know? like, "Thank you, sir. Here's <laughs> your chain, yeah. my good man." And you're just like, "What is going on?" Like, <laughs> Right. You're now, in public. Yeah. Man. <laughs> they don't know how to turn off. No, that. they yeah. can't turn it off. And and I did know how to turn it off. Right. It, it wasn't always twenty four seven. I mean, I loved acting. Yeah. yeah. But I knew how to like not do that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I liked hanging out with the film kids. Oh, and, you, you. Here, here's the funny thing. Okay, so you know, I'm in like a. Uh, kind of a, it, it's like the more ritzy area of Gainesville or I think it's ritzy I mean you may not but but it, like it's a nicer area of okay Gainesville, but sure. anyways there was this guy he was coming out of the upper crust over here and he was pissed off at him. this guy had to be an actor anyways he goes I will never and then he goes never come back <laughs> he, was, he was like 80 years old or something I was like, this guy, he's acting or something. Well, you that's because, like, the Gainesville Community Playhouse is right oh, yeah. over here. Yeah, so, true. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> he's like a fucking actor. <laughs> but that's so yeah. funny. Anyways, I was like, that. I was like, first of all, I was like, that dude looks like an idiot. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, he's probably an actor. It's like you shall have your come up <laughs> like, all right <laughs> but uh, so um tell me about how you got in the screenwriting guild right so because hey that's first of all that's a big accomplishment thank like you. when when you were talking about all these films and everything I thought you were just like a nerd and that kind of <laughs> stuff and then you're not just a nerd. If, yeah, you're a nerd, but you're not just a nerd. Yeah. But then, like when when people told me that, or when you told me that you were in the screenwriting guild, I was like, oh shit, this dude's the real deal. You know, I, I am. I am in the <laughs> WGA. Yeah. I pay my dues. Yeah. Sometimes and then yeah. sometimes they're late. <laughs> the the writers guild. Uh, for a long time, I. <laughs> The Writers Guild of America is seventy five dollars. Yeah, and uh, I'm in Florida right now, and I don't really get to um, enjoy the perks of being in the guild right. quite as much. Yeah, um, they have screenings in Los Angeles yeah. and special events, and you can meet the creators of movies and TV shows. And um, but that's in LA, and I'm currently in Gainesville, Florida, so. The way I saw it, like, if the guild wanted to come down here and get the money from me, <laughs> that's up to them. Yeah. But uh, they're going to have to pry it out of my cold, dead hands because <laughs> I'm not exactly, like, living the Hollywood life right now. Right. And then, so that detente lasted for a while yeah. where they were like, just so you know, you owe $75. And I was like, no, I know. I'm just not going to pay it. <laughs> and uh, then eventually they sent a letter that said, well, if you don't pay it, you're standing with the guild. <laughs> Fine. Over $75. <laughs> Over $75. Because <laughs> um, I thought it was funny. Yeah. I thought it was funny to be yeah. that petty. Um, <laughs> Basically, the way that you become a guild member is you sell a project or you sell like a couple of episodes mm -hmm. of a TV show or like a feature length script. Yeah. Um, the way it happened for me was I had written this script when I was in college and, um, you know, I always thought I was going to end up like writing comedy. Yeah. But the movies that, like, made the most impact on me growing up were science fiction films. Yeah. And, yeah. like, I am a huge sci-fi guy, and, like, I think it's, like, the most philosophical genre. Yeah. Where it's the one that you can, like, really explore. Like, you can mold it and that kind of stuff? Yeah, you can yeah. just create worlds yeah. and you can create imaginary circumstances right. and like there's something so appealing to me about that 
Well, and, I, I think I think what you're basically saying is that you don't think in limited terms because, like, with other genres, you have to be limited, and then with like sci-fi, you can just like it's a whole yeah open... you can expand outward yeah, yeah exactly so I when it comes to my imagination I don't like to put limits on it right I right. like to think about things that have never been done before have never been seen before yeah. things that I would want to see if I were going to see a movie and um you know, there's just that feeling of, like, sitting and watching something that's never been done before. It's, yeah. like, yeah. it's so exciting. Like, like I know you and I, well, I, I didn't really even know about it until you and Brian told me about it, but the Dune series. I mean, that was awesome, right? Yes. I mean, me and Brian, we invited you to go watch at the theater, but we were, like, so excited we just went up there and like we were like it, you know it was amazing yeah and that's exactly the kind of feeling like yeah ever since i saw that movie i've been working hard on my next sci-fi project yeah and you, you've told me and a few others about it and i'm not going to get into it but but it's it's awesome dude it's like it's going to be fun yeah yeah yeah, so really protect that and everything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because, like, you, like, the stuff that you come up with is awesome, dude. It's like, trippy. Like, I want I want to see you become the person that you know you can become, you know? I think, um, I think I'm getting there. Yeah, I yeah. think I've done, I've certainly come a long way. Um, in five years, because I yeah. quit drinking five years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, life is radically different than it was right. at the time, and I've made a lot of um, progress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's not perfect. Yeah. And I would never say that like that I live life in a perfect way or that I'm a completely, you know, healthily adjusted, yeah. whatever. But you've learned from your lessons, right? Yeah. So, cause that's what you got to do. Yeah. And we, we don't have to go into it, but what, you know, basically what happened, you know, um, uh, just, just give the brief synopsis. Though. Right. So I would written the script in college and I submitted 10 pages of it to this, like, this competition that was looking for 10 minute sci-fi action shorts yeah. and i figured well i've got this thing um so i cobbled together like what i considered the best 10 pages to be yeah and i sent that in sent in a directing sample and uh, a couple of men months went by and like i sort of forgot about it and then the people who ran the contest got back to me and they said, basically, we think your script is awesome. We don't think you can direct it. And I was like, absolutely. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is high concept science fiction. Right. It's not the easiest thing to direct. Yeah. But um, they knew a couple of people that they thought I would work well with yeah. and... I talked to the person that they recommended and we got along and we had a lot of the same tastes and um, we started working together and we produced this um, short film that we kind of used as a, a teaser for the main idea and one thing led to another and we actually ended up winning the entire contest. That's awesome. We dude. got a feature deal. That's awesome. Um, I got to meet one of my idols. Yeah. And yeah. I probably shouldn't say who, but I'll say that he's one of the best directors working in the industry. Yeah. yeah. And he's awesome. That's good. Like, he lives up to his reputation. Yeah. For sure. Um, now, now, this guy, this guy was your idol, right? Yes. And you got to meet your idol. I did. That's amazing. Right and they, there. you know, 
they kind of urge caution with that. It's like, yeah. don't meet your idols, you'll be disappointed. But yeah. This was like the one time where I met my idol, and the guy lived up to what yeah. Yeah. what I thought he would be like. Right. And um, yeah, I left that meeting, I was like, I want to be like that guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. he's a genius. And that, I mean, to this day, that was the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. And the fact that an idol of mine saw something that I made, yeah. that I helped make, an idea that came from me, he saw it and he was interested in it, and he took the time to meet with us, yeah. like, that means the world to me. Dude, and not only does it mean the world to you, but it shows what kind of promise you got um, because, yeah, well. well, you know, because like, dude, I mean, if, if for instance, like if I got to meet like, I don't know, the president or something, I don't fuck, fuck the president. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, like, yeah, I'd probably fall asleep. You know, you. like, like, you know, you, if you do something to where, you know, this person recognizes you because you've done such good work, it's a great thing. You know, I mean, it says a lot about you. But how do you how do you think that how do you think that you conceptualize these ideas? Like how do you what's your process for conceptualizing these ideas? Uh, it's tough. My my grandfather was a cartoonist. Oh and yeah. he was an artist. And um, people would ask him a similar question. They'd be like, How do you do what you do and he always basically said like if I knew how I did it yeah. I would be a millionaire because right. I would write the secret down and I'd give it to everyone and it's it's spontaneous it's it's just creative chaos basically yeah. in your brain yeah Basically, the answer is I have severe ADHD. <laughs> yeah. That's the answer, is that I'm constantly, like, just having songs and images and commercials and whatever the fuck, yeah. like, cascading in my brain. And occasionally yeah. just these weird connections get made. Right. And then, um... Listening to music yeah, yeah. helps a lot. When I'm listening to music, I feel like I kind of get transported somewhere. Right, right. And um, I start seeing these images, and like it's not clear at the beginning what they are or what they're supposed to be. Um, so. so more and more it's like a, a trailer comes together so it's like you so it's like you go into this transcendental like state right and then you're just because that's like in, in a way if you ever read stories on like nikola tesla and stuff mm -hmm. um that's how he came up with his inventions and stuff is he kind of went into this transcendental state where he just like saw every piece of yeah the, you know i used to like on car drives from like if we were going on a long car drive i'd be looking out like the passenger window just like out at the trees or like up at the sky and i would go somewhere else yeah, yeah. like i would just um or sometimes when i lay my head down before i go to bed it's like i i play scenes throughout like in my head yeah. and characters kind of come up or like locations or, yeah. or concepts sometimes I like ask a question and then I like construct something around that but there is this mental space that you go to and um and you just, you play around with different things. It's like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, yeah. And it, it like, I think it was um, Michelangelo, or there was a Renaissance artist who said, like, like, within a block of marble, like, the statue's already in there. Mm -hmm. 
and his job was basically just to reveal the statue that was already in the block of marble. Wow. And I like to think of ideas uh, for movies or for novels or whatever in the same way where it's like the idea exists in some perfect form out there somewhere. Yeah. And I am just an antenna for it. I am just a vessel for bringing it into the world. Wow. Like, the idea isn't mine. Even if I'm the one who can, like, channel it. Like, it exists, and I'm the one who's had the experiences and has the mind to be able to, like, translate it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's art to me, is about revealing truths that can't be stated. Mm. Like, it's how we know what we are as a species, or, like, what we believe, or what we strive to be. Mm -hmm. That's through art. Because once you've set up society, and you have irrigation systems and agriculture, and you've built skyscrapers and houses for everybody and everything is functioning so that people can eat, sleep, do everything that they have to do. Who are we once all of those needs are met? Or like, what do we want to give back with our limited time on this earth? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Never thought about it in that way. (laughs) That's, that's blowing my mind. Like, um, Dude, I don't even know where to go after that. Yeah, it just I don't blew, really either. It blew my mind. <laughs> like that got deep. So where where do you see yourself in five, ten years? Doing films. Yeah, yeah. Doing what I was doing um, while I was out in LA and doing it in a way that's better for me. Yeah, and in a way where. I'm not compromising my values right. or um, compromising my ideas. And, you know, maybe it'll take longer than yeah. five to ten years to get there, but um, I'm going to be striving for the same things I've been striving for for 30 years now. Yeah. Do you, do you, feel, like, do you feel like your talent, you were too young to know what you did, you were too young... You were too young and too talented to know how to go about. Um, I think I was too young to to accept the harsh realities of of an industry, any industry, yeah. or the um, the realities of working with people that you don't always see eye to eye with, right. or. Right. You know, the realities of people who see film not as an art form, but as a business that's right, meant right. for making money. Yeah, um, yeah. I went in with this conviction in my work. Uh, I went in believing that it spoke for itself, that yeah. it was good work, and it was uncompromising. And because of that, people were going to leave it alone. And yeah. I was wrong. You know... Um, that's kind of the same that happened with uh, the film I, I told you about that my friend was going to make for me mm-hmm. or about me. And uh, they just, uh, this is not to speak any bad about anybody or anything or any yeah. industry. Um, it's just the nature of an industry, you know, but they, they basically the people that were going to get on board with this film uh, wanted to like, it's a story about me and the military and all that kind of stuff. They wanted to make my story like about like me going to war and all this other stuff. And mm-hmm. I had never, I mean, I went to Korea and that's that didn't not, happen. yeah, it didn't happen. So, you know, there's, I understand from that perspective, how things can be, uh, you know, messed up and that kind of stuff. It, you know? Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it's just the nature of like what, you know, if you want to promote something and make money off of it, you have to kind of, 
you know, yeah. do, do that kind of stuff. I know? mean, it, it is a, uh, a reality that movies, because they're expensive. Right, and right. And you do need to be able to make money to justify the money that's right. being spent on making more movies. Um, you have to make it, it, basically, it's from a business perspective. Uh, right, so the artists like have this idea of what their artistry is about, and then the business people have this idea of what their business is about, and those two sometimes clash. They do. Yeah. But I also think they can work together. Yeah. yeah. I think that a movie that is good and well crafted and challenging to audiences, um, right now the model's kind of built around getting people in on opening weekend as quickly as possible and like the movie making their money back like that over a few days. Um, but I think a better model like long term would be one where people don't just want to go see a movie once in theaters, they want to go two times. They yeah. want to go three times, like Dune. Four times, like yeah. Dune. I I think you've seen it like over ten times, and I know that I've seen at least two. You know, and I don't. Even, I've, I've watched it a lot. Like yeah. I don't. I don't even watch movies because I hate. I hate watching most movies. Mm -hmm. You know, because exactly as you 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 know discussed with me in the past, the the movies they're making nowadays, like besides Dune and besides like. Uh, Blade Runner and all that kind of stuff like the movies that they make nowadays I don't even feel like I don't even feel like I'm included in like what you know the things that I would want to see sure. you know and like the reason I watched Dune two times even though I hate watching movies nowadays like I don't even have a TV here you know um, watching Dune those two times is a big testament to Dune itself you know? yeah because it like, was phenomenal. Because you know me, I don't watch news, I don't watch TV, I don't watch movies. I mean, I have HBO Max. I I got HBO Max just to watch Dune again, and then I canceled it this month. You know. <laughs> yeah, they just uh, they took it off of HBO Max, and all that did was motivate me to like right. go back and see it in theaters. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. want to go back and see it in theaters. Right, right. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sad to me when people say, like, like, I don't watch movies, because what that says to me is, like, that movies are not being made to draw that kind of audience member yeah, in, yeah. or just people don't really feel like they're being, like, respected. Yeah. Like, I know a lot of times I'll go to a movie, like a big budget movie, and I'll just feel pandered to yeah. as an audience member. I'll yeah. feel like I'm being sold something. The same then, shit over and over. Yes. It's basically, I mean, that's the reason I quit is because it's the same shit over and over. Right. Know? And I, you know, I don't really like being told what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. As a, a person, as a viewer, right. as an audience member, I value when when a film or a filmmaker trusts me as an audience member to be able to make my own conclusions about something or right. to be able to to understand the the intent behind certain creative decisions. Yeah. I think that's what Dune did really well, was it, it trusted its audience to rise to the level of right. the subject matter. And that's what I want to do as a filmmaker, is help elevate everybody's thinking to another yeah. level. Yeah. You know, good films should be challenging. And, it, and it's also, it's also like, kind of like what I gather from the way they're making films now is like they don't trust their audience and they have dumbed it down because they don't trust their audience. Yes, but as a result, that's ironically creating dumber audiences right. and then you get dumber movies <laughs> yeah. and then it becomes this self-perpetuating right. thing where 
people are getting dumber because they're watching dumb movies and yeah. then the movies have to get dumber because the audience is dumb and <laughs> it just goes back and forth. And yeah, yeah. It's it's a vicious cycle, man. Right, right, right. Well, uh, <laughs> anyways, I I uh, I really thank you for uh, doing this with me. Yeah, of and course. I want to I want to do it again because, like, dude, just like you know, it's a great conversation with you. I I kind of feel bad ending it, but you know, it's all right, but, man. Yeah, I'll be back. But, but like, I really enjoyed this conversation, especially about film. You know, because that's like your main thing. You know? It is. So, uh, but we can talk about like I don't know poop. Next <laughs> time. Like, there's so many other things right. I'm interested <laughs> in. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for watching the Futon interviews. This was Dan and uh, Dan Perea. So if you ever want to look up him in the future when he's a big star, look him up. Um, anyways, uh, thanks for watching the Futon series, uh, Futon interviews, and I'll see you. Bye, y'all. Thanks for watching. One second.